Hello, I am Daniel Ingram, professor of history at Ball State University. George Rogers Clark does not have a happy ending. The same qualities that made him a success as a military commander on the frontier made him a poor leader in a community. At the end of the American Revolution, Clark spent most of his time fighting the Indians in two raids in what is now Piqua and Springfield, Ohio. After the war, he was pursued by creditors, plagued by alcoholism, and interested in forming an American colony in Spanish territory, which embarrassed the American government. He built a cabin and mill in what would become the town of Clarksville, Indiana. His younger brother, William Clark, traveled with Meriwether Lewis in the Lewis and Clark Expedition on a trip following the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, crossing the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Ocean and back, as told by the diaries of Lewis and Clark. He suffered a stroke and moved across the Ohio River into the home of his sister's family, where he died. As a Virginian, Clark's greatest achievement was preparing the land north of the Ohio River for the Northwest Ordinance that would extend statehood and liberties to that area as part of the United States. Now, let's find out how he did that. David? Some kind of old flag? Oh, no, no. Not just a flag, but a piece of history. Your history, my history, the history of these United States of America. It all started long ago with just a handful of brave folks. Oh, settlers, surveyors, explorers, venturing into an unknown land with an unknown future. But one of the bravest was a young man by the name of George Rogers Clark. How young, Uncle David? Our age? What did he do? Oh, now hang on now. He was a little older than you. But there was someone else there your age who got to know him quite well. At the age of 19, George had traveled widely throughout Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana. He worked as a land surveyor, fought for the British in Lord Dunmore's war, and served as a distinguished leader in the Kentucky militia during the Revolutionary War. George Rogers Clark's military success helped officially end the American Revolution. But his victories were not without their losses. Later in his life, George would suffer his own defeat. But he didn't do all these things right away. A lot had to happen before his achievements could take place. But he didn't accomplish any of this on his own either. What do you mean, Uncle David? Well, just like anyone, George just didn't come out of nothing. He originally lived in Virginia, but moved from his home as a youngster to Harrodsburg, Kentucky. Looking to make his place in this world as a surveyor, measuring out plots of land for the new settlers. Back then, Kentucky wasn't even settled, but folks were looking for a fresh start and heard Kentucky lands were some of the finest. The year was 1774. A new war had broken out on the territory. Conflicts had arisen between the Indians and the new settlers conflicts that continued right to the American Revolution. These conflicts were known as Lord Dunmore's War. When George Rogers Clark learned the colony of Virginia was going to war, he signed up to help. As a young surveyor trying to make a name for himself, signing up to serve in Lord Dunmore's War seemed like the way to do it.
Without ever seeing a major battle, this was the beginning of Clark's military history and would eventually lead him to become a good general and a great leader. Knowing that Kentucky would not be able to support itself during the looming war, Clark attempted to ask Governor Patrick Henry to supply him with gunpowder and other supplies so Kentuckians could defend their forts against any British attacks from the West. I'm sorry to find that we should have to seek protection elsewhere. If a country were not worth protecting, it was not worth claiming. The Executive Council agreed to give him 500 pounds of gunpowder, but it was no easy task to get the gunpowder to the Kentucky forts. In Pittsburgh, the powder was loaded on a small boat and floated down the Ohio River. The Indians, who sided with the British after Lord Dunmore's war, watched, waiting for a chance to attack and stop the gunpowder from reaching the forts. Afraid they wouldn't be able to get the heavy gunpowder back safely, George and his men buried it on the banks of Limestone Creek and traveled back to the fort without it. Later, some settlers went back for it, but were discovered by the Indians who had been watching, and a skirmish broke out. Several men, husbands and fathers, died on both sides, but in the end, the settlers got their kegs of gunpowder. The next year, 1777, was terrible for the people living in the frontier settlements of Kentucky. The British commander, Henry Hamilton, encouraged Indians to menace the settlers. The people strengthened defenses at the forts as best they could. While men prepared to defend the stockade, women and children got ready to take care of any wounded and help make bullets. But George was determined to do more than just defend. He concocted an ambitious plan of attack in order to increase the territory of the new nation, gain access to the Wabash and Mississippi rivers, and with any luck, ease the threat of Indian attacks. George again traveled back to Virginia to share his plan with Governor Patrick Henry. Governor Henry made George a lieutenant colonel and issued secret orders to capture British forts along the Wabash and Mississippi rivers, just as George had hoped. You are to take especial care to keep the true destination of your force a secret. Their success depends upon this. With his new orders, George quickly traveled back to Kentucky to make further plans and began to gather an army. David's things. They aren't yours. And besides, I want to hear the rest of the story. Uncle David, you said General Clark went to Kentucky to gather an army. How did he gather his own army? Well, while General Washington and his men were fighting in the colonies in the east, the British also had men stationed in Detroit. Before these United States declared their independence, Great Britain and France had fought the French and the Indian War of 1763 over the territory. The British won control of the territory east of the Mississippi River, but there were still some French towns and traders living in the area. Counting on the French as allies, George thought if he could conduct a surprise attack on some of these French towns being controlled by the British, he could persuade the French villagers and traders to fight with him. A little band of men, which George was able to gather, moved down the Ohio River to Corn Island. But when word spread about how far they were traveling, many men deserted him. George's plan was to travel to Kaskaskia to inform the French who lived there that France had recently allied with these United States in the war for independence. The plan worked. George's men slipped into Kaskaskia unnoticed, and the British surrendered without a fight. I have an announcement for you. George was able to win the French as allies. It is an American principle to free and not to enslave those they conquer. 
George's new French allies brought another benefit. The French had become friendly with neighboring Indian tribes, which allowed George to convince them to, to remain neutral in the war, assuring them of their safety and presenting gifts to show his sincerity. With the easy success at Kaskaskia, George sent Captain Bowman and a small group of men to take other surrounding Illinois towns at Prairie du Rocher, Saint Philippe, and Cahokia. They also gave up without a fight. George's fair treatment of the French settlers won the trust of a priest, Father Gibault. I'm Father Gibault. Father Gibault assisted George in carrying some letters asking the people living in Vincennes, a small village nearby, to join the Americans. Father Gibault soon returned with the good news that the American flag was flying over Vincennes and its fort, Fort Sackville. But wouldn't the British soldiers in Detroit at least try to win them back? They sure did, and George knew they would too. After Father Gibault told him about Vincent surrendering to the Americans, he immediately sent Captain Helm to take charge of it. But Vincent's and Fort Sackville didn't remain in American hands very long. British commander, Lieutenant Governor Henry Hamilton in Detroit, rushed with reinforcements to regain control of the area. Many Indians, not allied with the French and Americans, joined Hamilton along the way increasing the size of his army to 500 men by the time he reached Vincennes. Far greater than the tiny number of Americans stationed oh. there. Sir, is this an honorable surrender? Yes, yes it is. There was nothing to do but surrender to Hamilton. Long enough men were surrendering. To the front! But a Spanish merchant named Vigo reported crucial information to Clark. Vigo had been captured by the British. But because he was a Spanish citizen, he was considered a non-combatant. Hamilton released him on the condition that he would not do anything to harm British interests on his way back to St. Louis. True to his word, Vigo traveled to St. Louis before returning to Kaskaskia to inform Clark. Vigo informed Clark that the British were repairing and strengthening the fort. Before long, Fort Jackville would be too strong to be recaptured by a small army. George would have to move quickly to have any hope of reclaiming Vincennes and Fort Sackville. With no way around and no time to lose, Clark chose to push ahead. He ordered the men to build canoes to keep their baggage and supplies dry while crossing the river. But unfortunately, there was not enough room for the soldiers. They had to march through the freezing river as the waters rushed up past their waist to their chests. The soldiers did their best to stay cheerful, even though their food supply was running out. They were constantly cold and wet, and some of them were suffering severely from exposure. But a young drummer boy traveling with the army didn't lose hope. This brave boy kept the entire company amused with his drumming. With nothing else to entertain the men, the rhythm of the boy's drum pushed the men forward, helped them forget the cold, and reminded them of their purpose. At the deepest part of the river, the boy could no longer march. So he put his drum in the river, climbed on and drifted on it like a boat. The men roared with <laughs> laughter, but it was a proud moment for the boy. He was only your age, but he was helping to rally the troops and keep their spirits up. In the evenings, the men searched for higher ground to set up camp and rest. Stopping for the night gave the army time to cook a simple meal and to attempt to dry their wet clothes. But when they reached the Wabash River, the willing, along with the desperately needed supplies, was nowhere in sight. After waiting for several days, there was no more time to waste. 
Knowing the icy waters and lack of food and supplies that would now challenge the men to their limits, Clark encouraged the men as best he could, telling them they had to reach Vincennes or the new country could lose control of the Ohio River Valley and allow the British to attack General George Washington and the Continental Army. In a desperate attempt to inspire and persuade the army to continue, Clark smeared gunpowder to blacken his face as war paint. Then he plunged into the icy water of the Wabash River, cheering and shouting. Ah! Sure enough, the men followed. After two days without food, and a total of 18 grueling days of marching roughly 180 miles, despite the dreadful conditions, they finally caught sight of Vincennes on the afternoon of February 23rd. By dark, they had made their way into town and taken up positions close to the walls of the fort. The British, still unaware of anything. By the time morning had come, the British were still shooting their cannons from the fort, even though they were no match for the American sharpshooters, who were trained simply from hunting deer and bears with their Kentucky long rifles. Even as it seemed George's men were holding out and even succeeding over the British, when George sent in a message suggesting surrender, Hamilton replied that he had no intention of giving up. About noon, Hamilton's messenger brought a note requesting a truce. Colonel Clark, fine to see you again. Fearing that a short peace would allow time for British reinforcements to arrive, George refused and again demanded a complete surrender of the fort, its men, and supplies. Just at that moment, a party of Indians Hamilton had sent out returned, unaware that the fort was under attack. To prove to the Indians that they could no longer depend upon the British to help protect them, George ordered them killed in full view of the fort. Stunned by the initial attack and the killing of the Indians, Hamilton finally decided to give up. Accepting the Articles of Surrender which Clark offered him. Promptly at 10 o'clock the next morning, February 25th, 1779, Hamilton and his men marched out of Fort Sackville. The British had sent relief forces, but when they learned of the surrender of the fort, they turned around and went back to Detroit. This time, the American flag flew over the town of Vincennes and its fort permanently.
Some things we may never know, such as who was that drummer boy? Sometimes it is fun to think about what might have happened. For example, what would happen if George Rogers Clark had attacked Fort Detroit after capturing Vincennes? What do you think might have happened? Some things we do not know, such as was George Rogers Clark ever afraid that he would be captured? Was he interested in being married and starting his own family? How did he feel about the Native Americans that he met and dealt with? Those would be things that you might find out more about by reading Clark's diaries and letters posted online by the Indiana Historical Bureau.